So beginning at verse 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'll give you, even as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, more of an in-depth approach to this particular book. I believe that the day that we live in demands this kind of study. You see, many people are aware that we're living in what we call the biblical last days. And with so much going on in the world, the question is often asked, are we in the last days? So at this time, we need to remember the primary sign that we are in those days. Now, many times when people do a series in uh, the last times and all, they'll turn you, and I'm not doing that now, but they'll turn you into to, uh, to Matthew 24. Because in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, Jesus gives an in-depth um, message related to those days just prior to his return. And when you look at that, you'll, you'll see that, that Jesus gave us a, a, a word. He gave to us an insight, uh, actually answering a question to tell us what is the primary sign that we're in the last days. You see, a lot of times when people are looking at the subject of the last days, they like to speak concerning the wars, the rumors of wars, the pestilence, the famines, and, and things of that nature. And those are all things that Jesus speaks about. Those are things that he refers to. But the number one primary thing in answer to a question is, uh, is an interesting thing that sometimes we don't know. And the answer to that question is, when asked, is going to, I think it needs to be told today because he taught that deception would be a primary sign of the last days. And in Matthew 24, verses 3 through 5, it reads, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. I want you to note that the question that was asked, what will be the sign? Jesus gave a lot of signs, but what is the primary sign that you're living in the last days? The answer is spiritual deception. Spiritual deception. Spiritual deception means that we have an openness to spiritual error. We have an, uh, a welcoming spirit to false teaching. That's not new. In the Old Testament, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 5, at verse 31, it reads, The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? In Jeremiah in chapter 2, he had said in verse 13, My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, hewed out and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So what is the primary sign? People who are receptive to false doctrine. Now, Jesus gave the church the warning. He had said, you need to watch. You need to be on guard. You need to be on the alert. In, in Matthew 24 and verse 42, he said, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Now, why would he say be on the alert? Why would he say be on the watch? Because in the last days, the church is falling asleep. Now, the church is in a terrible battle right now. Deception is entering in, and we are allowing it to infect us. Now, remember, Jesus gave a command in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely 
I am with you always to the very end of the age. Commanding them, teaching them to observe all that I've taught you, all that I've commanded you. Jesus said that our commission was not simply evangelizing, but instructing, teaching people, telling them the things that, that make for being a disciple. He had said, make disciples and teach them to obey all things. And the most basic way to be taught and obey all things is through the systematic approach to studying the word of God. But that doesn't happen in every church. Now, Paul, when he was writing to young Timothy, said this. He said, Timothy, you need to preach the word. In 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, he said, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why would you do that? Well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves, teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That's in the church today. You know, sometimes when I've taught in the past, when I have attempted to teach verse by verse and through the whole counsel of God, there have been times when people have gotten very upset at me, and, they, and I don't really, I have to be honest with you, I, I'm not moved by that. I am grieved by it. Because people will say, well, that sounds so harsh. That sounds so judgmental, especially in these days that we're living in now. Because people think that truth is my truth and you have your truth. And there's no such thing as that. There's just the truth. And either we hold fast to the truth or there is no truth. And what has happened to the church is we say, well, that's my feeling. That's my emotion. That's how I see it. Well, you may not be seeing it the way God has presented it. And that's why we need the study of the word of God. We need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and we need to understand that because we're living in a time right now when people are doing exactly what Paul said they would do. And that's why he said to, to Timothy, you need to preach the word. You need to convince them, rebuke them, exhort them with all long suffering and teaching. Why? Because the time is coming where they'll no longer endure healthy teaching. They're not going to put up with it. They don't want to hear it. What will they do? They'll heap unto themselves teachers because they'll say what you're itching to hear and they're going to voluntarily turn aside from the truth and be turned unto fables. They're going to begin to believe garbage. And that's what's happening today. Many don't teach with this kind of conviction. And because that's true, error has crept in. And deception is rampant. Error today is accepted as biblical doctrine. There are many professing Christians who do not value a Bible study. They do not value Christian teaching. Uh, you can see it on social media. They post their opinions and sometimes they, they will contradict the clear exposition of Scripture. I, I happen to read posts a lot. And uh, some things that people will write are tragic, are tragic indeed. And the problem is um, people don't, uh, don't correct it. And then when you do, if you say, well, that, that's not what Paul said, then you've got a, a, just a ton of people who will call you a bigot or whatever. That's a common thing today. And it's sad. I, I, I listened for a few minutes to a, a young, quote-unquote, woman preacher who uh, was saying that uh, Paul was uh, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, anti-Semitic. And, uh, you know, this is a man who said that I would give up my own salvation for my brethren according to the flesh, but she's saying he's anti-Semitic and anti-woman. And see, there's a lot of error like that that's crept in and is accepted now as doctrine. They believe those things. And nobody corrects it. In 2022, a Gallup poll uh, said that only 20% of Americans say that the Bible is the literal word of God. Only 30% of Protestants say that the Bible is true and 15% of Catholics. So that makes it clear that the Christian faith is under attack. And again, many pastors and teachers are not teaching the whole council. And the weakness of the church is the fruit and reflection of its pastors as well as, it, as its teachers. And so that gives me reason to spend time in this powerful, small book. See, Jude is a book written to encourage Christian believers, and you'll see this in a moment, to contend for the faith. Why is that? Because the church has been referred to as the repository of truth. In 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul had said, If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so when people say there is no truth, the fact is the scripture teaches that the church is the repository. We have had the truth deposited 
into us, and we're to contend earnestly for it. We're to protect it. You see, it's the truth that we hold fast to that is referred to as the faith or the gospel. And it's the truth that sets you free. And it's the truth that the enemy tries to undermine. Remember that the first question ever recorded in the Bible, the first question came from the mouth of Satan. And his question has God said. First question in the Bible. If you read the Bible just by, you know, its punctuation, a period here, a comma there, a semicolon here, whatever. If you read it, you, you won't find a question mark in the first uh, two chapters. It's in the third chapter that you find a question mark. And the first question mark you find in Scripture is from the mouth of the serpent, as God said. From the beginning, with the two parents, our first parents, he questioned God's word, as God said. And that has continued to this day. In Genesis 3.1, it says, The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from my from any tree of the garden. So he's been bringing doubt into the word of God ever since. Now, Jesus commanded the church to go into the world, right? He said, go into the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is the word of eternal life. And the gospel needs to be presented accurately. And because it is so important, the enemy has worked to undermine the scriptures, you see, before the church was even birthed, Jesus was already warning that false doctrine would creep in. All the way in Matthew, for example, chapter 7, verse 15, he gave a warning. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. In chapter 24, uh, verse 24 of Matthew, false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So that's something we're supposed to be prepared for. That's something we should have our spiritual antenna up for. Our ears should be attuned. We should be listening to see whether these things are so. As we've been going through the book of Acts on Sunday morning, even from very early after the church had been birthed, bad teaching began to infiltrate. And we've been studying Acts and we saw, for example, how the legalists had tried to add the law to God's grace. In various books, we see exhortations and warnings to be on the alert. And I'll give you several scriptures. If you take notes, you might want to uh, take these down. Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. Paul said, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Paul in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 through 15, speaking of these men, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he's to be accursed, as we have said before. So I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is accursed. Ephesians 4, verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, 
that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or to be disturbed either by spirit, which would speak of a false prophecy, or message would be an alleged conversation with the Apostle Paul, or a letter as if from us to effect that the day of the Lord has come. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Titus 1, 10 and 11, there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Hebrews 13, 9, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, though um, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. First John chapter 4, 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard has come in and even now is already in the world. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. I told you we have a lot of scriptures today. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Revelation Chapter 2, verse 20, to the church of Thyatira, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. That's just a few of the scriptures, just to show you how many there are. See, when, when, when you're not through, taught through the whole counsel of God, you may think that that guy speaking in this way it's just his opinion. No, the scriptures from A to Z are warning us concerning those things from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Deception. Deception. Why? Because the message that God gave to us through the gospel is the only message whereby a man or woman must believe to be saved. Because there's only one name, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. And that, that's, that's what the Bible teaches. And every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, that's Christianity. That's not a watered-down version of it. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what, that, that's what we believe as Christians, is that word, the Word of God is inspired, and the Word of God declares to us, and we're to hold fast to that Word, and that's the Word Jesus taught us, and that's the Word Jesus told us to go and to teach. Now, during the time of the book of Jude, false teachers are entering. So Jude is actually writing... Uh, to strengthen believers. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a few things more as a basic introduction, and I'll give you a few things about it that will help us to, to understand a little bit about this book. One, in his introduction, notice how he introduces himself as, as Jude, the brother of James. Now, without going into a whole lot about this, some identify Jude as one of the 12 apostles. There are some who identify that. So when you look at the list of the names of the apostles, two of the apostles were named Judas or Jude. Now, Jude would not be one of these because the apostle mentioned in the names of the 12 is referred to as uh, the son of James. In Luke 6, 15 and 16, it reads Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. According to Acts chapter 12, 1 and 2, the apostle James was martyred by Herod Agrippa. So that leaves us with James, the Lord's brother, which is mentioned in Galatians chapter 1. Remember in Matthew 13, 55, a question was asked, isn't this, speaking of Jesus, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And so Jude 
is not the apostle. He's the Lord's brother. When was this written? No exact time can be fixed, but commentators believe it was between 65 and 70 A.D. Why is that? Because no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem is found in the letter. And the, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. So this would have taken place prior to 70 A.D. So there has been sufficient time for people to hear the gospel and to begin to distort it. Somebody said Jude's approach to their presence and the comments he makes sound very much like Peter's second letter. So some would believe they were written around the same time and may have influenced one another. Jude's letter most likely came after Peter's because Peter writes anticipating the rise of false teachers. You see that in 2 Peter 2. While Jude records their actual presence in the church. Now, Jude actually quotes the Apostle Peter's second letter. When you look at verses 17 and 18, and we'll get to those verses and look at them in about two years, but when you look at it, it says, You, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Well, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, Peter said, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing, following their own evil desires. And so it would seem obvious that Jude was written after 2 Peter, and he's quoting him. Now, the message, contend for the faith. And that's what our introduction is going to deal with, contending for the faith. The letter is concerned with the infiltration of false teachers into the body of Christ. And he's writing to condemn these false teachers and encourage believers to grow in their understanding of who Jesus Christ is. So with that, we'll begin our study. That's your intro. <laughs> Verses 1 and 2. I won't take that long, I promise you. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So he identifies them first. I want you to see this. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He didn't say uh, anything that could have made him more, uh, have more prestige. Isn't that interesting? He could have said something other than the way he introduced it, but he introduces himself in the proper way. He says, I'm a slave. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm a bond slave. I'm, I'm one who belongs to the Lord. I am one who obeys his commands. A, a, a servant or a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is one who's devoted to someone else to the disregard of their own interests. So he identifies them first and foremost as I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I am a servant and that's what I am. And he, he's writing to those, he says, who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus. Now, I want you to know he doesn't identify who he's writing to, but his readers will prove to be more than likely a Jewish group of people because we're going to see he's going to use various Old Testament illustrations. Now, he speaks of them as the called. When he says you're the called, those are the ones he's referring to have been saved. You are the called. In John 6, and 45, no man can come to me, Jesus said, except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up. At the last day, it's written in the prophets, they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father comes to me. And so to be the called would be referring to those who are saved, those who have been called out of this world and called to Christ. He says that they're sanctified. The word sanctified speaks of separation. You've been separated from the profane, from the evil, from the evil of the world, and you've been consecrated and dedicated to God. And God has done that with us. He has sanctified us. How does he do it? Well, he does it by his word, and he does it by his Holy Spirit. In John 17, 17, Jesus in his prayer said, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So you're set apart for service to God by his word, but also by his spirit. In Acts 20, 32, uh, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are saved. We are 
set apart by his word, empowered by his spirit. In 1 Peter 1, 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the spirit, to obedience in the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So we're set apart, we're empowered by his word and spirit, and he says, and we're preserved. That word speaks of being guarded or taken care of. It speaks of being kept by God. God is caring for you. 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so we're kept by the power of God through faith, 1 Peter 1.5. He says, mercy and peace in verse 2, be multiplied unto you. That's the customary greeting. It's speaking of the grace of God. And now we get into the first portion of the letter. Beloved, verse 3. While I was very diligent to write you, to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Certain men have crept in unnoticed, long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our Lord, rather grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, contending for the faith. The word diligent, I'm compelled to write you. I am doing so with an urgency. And this urgency that is internal, that is inspiring me, is inspiring me to exhort you. I'm exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. The word contend is a Greek word that means something that is strenuous or requires exhaustive effort. It was a, a word that was used to describe a wrestling match. And it's speaking of, of all the energy that is going to be used when you're doing that. So they use the word contend in that way. What is he saying? He's saying you are to agonize for the truth of the gospel, the body of truth that has been delivered to us one time for all time. This is a call to us as believers to fervently agonize for God's truth. You can never have apathetic feelings towards God's word. That is what has messed up the church. And that's your opinion. That's what you think. Well, God's grace, you know, I, you know he knows that I like sleeping with my girlfriend. And, 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 and you know... Where in the Bible does it say there has to be a marriage license signed? I, I like to smoke pot. It's medicinal. The law permits it. You know? Didn't he make every herb of the field good? <laughs> See, when, when the word of God is actually divided properly, it has a tendency of doing one of two things. One is convicting because I see that I don't line up with that. It convicts me. What am I supposed to do? Feel condemned? No, Jesus isn't going to condemn me. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But conviction is something that's good for me. It helps me to see the way of the Lord and to see where I'm wrong. And if I actually love him, it helps me to repent. You know, I'm a married man. And, and there are times that I could hurt my wife's feelings. And if I want to argue and win an argument with her, it's one of the dumbest things I can do, not because I can't, but because I have to ask myself, what's the purpose of it? Why do I have to contend over everything if it doesn't matter? And that's where a lot of guys and their wives have problems in the early days of their marriage. Who's going to be the boss? Well, the bottom line is it's not a contest, is it? It's supposed to be a unified effort to live for Christ. So if we have to win every argument, we're going to lose somebody as we do so. What we need to do is contend for that which matters. And the word of God is that which matters. I don't want to argue over whether infants should be baptized. I will if somebody wants to, but I don't want to because that doesn't, in the end, matter. What matters is Jesus Christ, Lord. That matters. Did Jesus die on a cross for my sins? That matters. Was Jesus buried but raised the third day? That matters. Those things we contend earnestly for, those things matter. And so we have to be aware of that. 
And so what he's saying is we need to agonize for the truth. This is the body of truth that has been delivered to us. We're to, we're to fervently agonize for it. Why? Again, the gospel saves from eternal judgment. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you who are saved. It's God's word that works in us. We contend earnestly for that. When I first got saved, coming out of the background, and I won't say this say much other than this, coming out of my background, which was influenced by the hippie movement, which is, you know, just do your own thing, just everything's okay, just don't hurt somebody, that kind of thing. That's exactly how I thought. I don't care. You want to be a Christian? That's cool with me. I don't care. You want to, you want to be a follower of Buddha? I don't care. That's fine. You want to be spiritual? Be spiritual. I don't really care. And I didn't. I didn't care. And so I get saved. And now my eyes are opened. And I'm saying, wow, we need Christ. And that was, by the, the way, that was the heart of the Jesus movement. That was the heart of the Jesus revolution. We were all turned into evangelists. When we got saved, the best thing we could do is tell somebody else. We were taught that. We didn't keep it to ourselves. You know, we didn't hide it under a bushel. We even had a little song, hide it in the bushel. No, you know. <laughs> I mean, that, that was true. You know, that's why you tell your mom. That's why you tell your dad. That's why you tell your brothers, your sisters. That's why you tell your friends. That's why you tell your neighbor. That's why you tell. Why? Because they're going to hell. They don't know Christ. We believed that. We didn't think it was okay to be this or be that. or No, we didn't. We said there's one way to heaven. It's by the cross of Christ. And see, that's Bible. That's what we were taught. That was our foundation. And, and so because the enemy knows that the gospel is powerful to set people free. He works to undermine and dilute it. And he does it uh, in a lot of ways, including using false teachers and false prophets. Now, Paul knew that he had been strategically placed as a defender of the truth of God. In Philippians 1.17, he said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. So the church has been placed in, in that position to contend earnestly for the word. Now, Jude was telling his readers that false teachers have crept into the church. Again, 2 Peter 2, verse 1, Peter said the same thing. There, are false pe there were false prophets among the people. There will be false teachers among you who, he said, will secretly bring in destructive heresies. False teachers don't walk in with a sign. False teacher, come and hear false doctrine. They don't do that. It's been said that there's a beautiful side of evil. There's a beautiful side of evil. So the false teacher will give you something you want to hear, something that appeals to you. They have a common trait, false teachers. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They teach that Jesus is not God in the flesh. They undermine the testimony of Scripture, and they try to present different ways to get to heaven. In, in 2 John uh, verse 7, chapter 1, verse 7, John said, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, one of the things about these, and, and I want you to see this in verse 4, certain men, he's speaking of the false teachers, have crept in. False teachers are evangelists. They go into the world and they bring their heresy. They'll go into the world. You'll see them on 10 speeds. You'll see them in front of a windshield. They go out into the world. True. You know that. It's true. They go out into the world bringing their error. And they'll even come to infiltrate the body of Christ. And notice what they're doing in verse 3. He says that they're undermining the faith, which was, notice, once for all delivered to the saints. Once for all. When he says once for all, it's another way of saying one time for all time. This is a message that needs no additions. This is a message that is complete in itself. 
and doesn't need future revelation from Muhammad or future revelation from Joseph Smith. This is a complete testimony that has been given to us that is all that is necessary for us to know. You don't need new revelation because we don't obey the old anyway. So we don't need the new. And anything that comes that is new is error. The message is given one time for all time. Somebody said this verse teaches that a body of truth from God has been delivered to humanity and that this faith has been wholly delivered, completely delivered. This seems to indicate that no further revelation from God is necessary. God has told us in Scripture everything we need to know about who he is, who we are, and what will happen to the earth in the future. We know the nature of God does not change. I was listening to somebody just this last week who was telling us that, that we need new revelation, present revelation, that the old isn't good enough. And he's calling himself a Christian pastor. So you see that. It's out there. And some of you know what I'm saying is true. So notice how he says certain men, verse 4 again, have crept in unnoticed. Why should the church contend for the faith? Because wicked and deceitful false teachers have snuck in unnoticed. What they do is they appear humble and they can be very appealing and they can come off very intellectual and they pretend to have depth. They pretend to be teachers of the truth but in reality, their teachings are undermining and changing the gospel. I've had people who have come into this church, into this church congregation over the years, who have done just that. And I've, I've identified them and I've spoken to them. I, I can still remember on one occasion, after a Wednesday Bible study, two men came in who wanted to debate with me about who Jesus was and all. And I had them in my office for about an hour. And... Uh, one of them was just telling me, he says, you know, you're wrong. Your teachings are wrong. And this is what the truth is. At the end of his conversation, he, he actually was sitting close to me. I had a chair and he was maybe two feet away. And he leans over in the chair and he sticks his hand out like this. And he says, this is the hand of God calling you to himself. Take my hand and be free. So I shot him. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, of course he didn't. I just wanted to. I said, no, why would I take the hand of a false teacher? No. But that, they're, they're, they, I'm telling you, I mean, they're out there, very bold. And, and, and they're out there telling you things. Now, notice how it says, who were long ago marked out. So God's word long ago had warned against changing his word and what would happen. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 12.32 See that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. Deuteronomy 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. This warning would also have a contemporary application because there are warnings that are given by Jesus, Peter, Paul, throughout the scriptures in the New Testament also. Now notice in verse 4, they are ungodly men. When it says ungodly men, it's another way of saying they're notorious and wicked sinners. These are men who profess to know God, but are in reality without God. Why is it that they're ungodly? Because they change the grace of God into License to sin. They believe they can perform any manner of sin and still claim to be righteous. Without going into a whole lot, the Gnostic heresy, we saw that in 1 John, was famous for that. They said that it isn't what your body does, it's really what your soul does. So because my body, you know, it has no value, I could go about and do anything I wanted because it was my body, it's okay. That Gnostic heresy, that kind of thinking crept into the church very early. And what they were doing is they were undermining God's 
uh, call to us to follow him as well as the promises of God to, to, uh, to purify our lives and make us into righteous individuals. People who actually, uh, when people saw us, would know that there was something different about us and giving us the opportunity to share with them how that God forgives sins and transforms lives. One of the things that bothers me is sometimes, but well, one of the things, I got a thousand things that bother me. <laughs> one of the things that bothers me in our contemporary age is that we have, we have many. And I, I can tell you, again, sometimes I don't want you to come in thinking, oh, I'm going to bash all the people. No, but there will be certain, certain things I do refer to. They're contemporary. This is what's going on. And, and there are those whom I encounter that perhaps you have too, or maybe you haven't, who have a, have a message that says, you know, you can basically do anything you want because God is God of grace, and therefore God's grace is what saves you. And, and shall I continue in sin so that grace may abound? Paul said, God forbid. How can I who have died to sin live any longer therein? Grace was not given to us so that I could continue smoking pot, drinking, running around with different women and things like that. Grace wasn't given to me for that. Grace was to set me free from that. And when somebody walks in and says, it's okay to do that, it's all right, you know, you can smoke this, you can snort that, and still be a believer. No, what you're doing is you are, you, are, you are undermining the power of the Holy Spirit who can set you free from the bondage of sin. That's what you're doing. You're, you're allowing yourself to remain in sin. And that's, not, and that's what a false teacher will give you permission to. I, I remember many years ago, our church was brand new. It was, was less than a year old. I was teaching uh, uh, when we used to meet... Um, in Ontario at Central, Central School. And, and I shared kind of like what I'm doing now. I haven't changed a whole lot over the years, and I was sharing kind of directly like I, I am right now. And somebody walks up to me and says, you know, I don't come to this church. I usually go, and they told me what fellowship they go to. He says, I usually don't go to this church. I'm glad I did because sometimes I need condemnation. And it's a condemnation. I said, oh, you're confusing me with Rawl. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. They were, they were mistaking the word condemnation with the word conviction. See, condemnation, the enemy condemns, our heart condemns. Conviction, God awakens us to who we are. It's like he takes a mirror and shows us so that we can repent. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is what draws me to a repentance because the Spirit of God is telling me I'm not pleasing to God. And so condemnation causes me to feel judged by God. Conviction of the Spirit draws me closer to him because I relinquish those things that keep me from him. And so a false teacher is going to keep you in bondage while you think you're free, when in fact you're not. You just have a long chain on your ankle that you haven't even stretched to its utmost yet. That's all it is. You're still in bondage. You just don't know you are. And so false teachers will bring in ungodliness. In Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. And then he says this, how unflattering. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good deed. Strong words. They deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Their teachings amount to error concerning salvation. They don't necessarily make it very clear, but their teachings, when followed, take you away. And notice he says they were long ago, long ago, marked out for this condemnation. Their doom has been written down in Scripture. In Revelation 20, verses 13 through 15, the sea gave up its dead. Death and Hades gave up their dead. And each one was judged according to his deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was found whose name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And Revelation 22, 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Contend earnestly for the faith that has one time for all time been delivered to the saints. 
for evil men have crept in unnoticed. And they're bringing, uh, bringing error and heresy. They will undermine your walk with God. And ultimately, they're going to suffer the penalty for it. As we go through the word of God, you need to cross-reference everything I say if you can. You need to listen with a, a heart to have discernment so that you can know whether or not I'm teaching you the truth. I have no problem with that. False teachers don't want to be uh, checked. I don't mind. I don't mind because I prepare these studies with a good conscience. If, if I teach you error, I need to be corrected. Please never feel you can't say, how come you said or what does this mean? I'm open. I'll listen to you. I'll kick you out, but I'll listen. <laughs> because a false teacher cannot be corrected. A false teacher wants your soul. And what they're going after is to destroy you. You just don't know it. And you are, I can be just very, very innocent in that. That's why Paul spoke of them, that they are actually uh, coming in for those who are innocent, the naive, the ones who just believe every word. Some people, some people will swallow anything. My nephew Patrick, when he was about two and a half, used to pick up things in the backyard. And, and sometimes he would put them in his mouth. Babies do that, right? Those of you who are parents, you know that. You have to watch your children or they're crawling or whatever. Watch them. Because if there's something there, they're going to take it and put it in their mouth. They just do that. My, my four kids did that. And I'm sure I did it too. Because babies will put anything in their mouth and swallow anything, right? So my nephew's in the backyard and my sister Madeline was doing some gardening and she turns and she looks at Patrick and Patrick, what's in your mouth? And Patrick has something in his mouth because his little cheek is bulging. And she says, what's in your mouth? Spit it out. And he's. And she sticks her finger in there like every mama has done. And she pulls it out. It was a snail. We didn't know we were French. So she... Babies will put anything in their mouths. And baby Christians do the same thing. Baby Christians do the same thing. Well, he said it on TV. He wrote a book. I listened to him on the radio. He has conventions. People give him money. They creep in. Unchecked. And destroy your life. That's why word by word, going through the word of God, safeguards you. It gives you discernment. And there was a big problem that Jude was having that we're going to be looking at. That's your introduction. And we'll pick up next week at verse 5.